This is Dr. David Pomeroy, your host on ADHD Focus. I wanted to remind you that the show is not intended to be a recommendation for diagnosis or treatment of any condition for any specific person. Please consult your mental health professional or doctor managing your ADHD or mental health issues about any diagnosis or treatment related information that you hear on the show. Refer your ADHD provider to the show if he or she would like more information. Thank you. Today, I've got a guest who can help us get through one of the most difficult aspects for anyone dealing with someone with ADHD and particularly for parents. And that's Dr. Jerome Schultz, uh, who is a psychologist and and Harvard Medical School lecturer in psychology in the Department of Psychiatry and he now consults with school districts in the Boston area, does writing for Attitude Magazine and understand.org. He currently works in schools with teachers and students two days a week. He's written an excellent book in terms of a resource for all parents, Nowhere to Hide, Why Kids with ADHD and LD Hate School and What We Can Do About It. Dr. Schultz, welcome to the program. Dr. Pomeroy, thank you very much for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. I saw the announcement of your recent webinar through Attitude Magazine, and for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's ADD itudemag.org, and as soon as I saw something about motivation, ADHD, I thought I've got to not only listen, but see if I can get Dr. Schultz on the show. So one of the, the things the webinar started with, and I think it's, it's helpful for people to understand, that there are three types of motivation. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, for the purpose of the discussion about kids and young adults with ADHD, I'd like to uh, kind of uh, build a foundation of understanding about motivation. And, and we're most familiar with uh, uh, what's called intrinsic motivation, and that, that's the kind of motivation that comes from uh, inside you. So you uh, it's the kind of motivation that describes the kind of learning that you do because you value learning for the sake of learning. The, it talk, mm -hmm. That's your innate desire to really expand your knowledge, improve your skill level, and, and, uh, and, and build your knowledge level. The other kind of motivation that uh, we know about is called intrins extrinsic motivation. And there, I'd like to break that into two kinds of extrinsic motivation. But at its heart, it means that it's the kind of motivation uh, that makes you acquire knowledge because you're going to get something out of it. You might improve your ability to teach and reach kids with ADHD. If you're a teacher, uh, if, you're, if you're a teacher and you want to do better in your work, you might uh, tune into a podcast like this because you want to let your boss know that you've been working on your skills in this area. Extrinsic motivation can be viewed as something that you do to get something positive. It can also be viewed as something you do to avoid something negative. So uh, if someone else is questioning your ability to manage kids, you might be motivated to learn more about it. If you're a child and you're looking for, to get a teacher or a parent off your back, uh, you might uh, – do what's necessary so that you can get that negative thing or person away from you. So there are, there are other, there are many different theories of motivation, but I think if we look at intrinsic and extrinsic, extrinsic motivation as the foundation for this discussion, that'd be a good starting place. So one question that comes up to me um, in that it, since many kids these days are motivated quote unquote, by getting video game time. That's what they're interested in. That's what they want to gain skills in. Um, but that's used as the, the carrot to when you get your homework done, then you can have some video game time. So is that uh, an extrinsic get something out of it motivation? Yeah, those kind of rewards that are put into place 
after a child does some desired behavior like do homework or or pay attention to something or get a book report done so Mm -hmm. the reward at the end of that it's not a bad thing that's kind of like the paycheck that we get at the end of our work one of the problems comes with kids with ADHD is that they focus on the reward and uh, and don't focus their attention on the task because they're really not getting this. They don't have this intrinsic motivation. They, they yeah. seem not to care too much about doing too well. They're just going for the gold ring. Right, right. I'll get done with it fast and and uh, so I can get the video game time. So, right. and I know each of us have heard a variety of of um, things that, or I guess the way that kids behave or what they say that um, an adult would conclude, oh, you're just not motivated. Um, So uh, what are some of those kinds of things that lack of desire certainly is, and I think a lot of kids figure, I don't want to have to do this page of math problems or write a book report about Russian, right. middle age, whatever. <laughs> right, exactly right. And you're right. You, we do see a lot of behaviors in kids that look like uh, they're not motivated to do their work. And uh, there may be some kids who aren't motivated just because they're not interested in it. But mm-hmm. I think it's important to read those behaviors that look like poor motivation as uh, the possibility of something else. So what you might see in the classroom or what you might see at homework is, a, is as you said, a lack of desire. A kid is saying, I, I don't want to do this. I have no desire to do this. The other thing you might see is a, a lack of relevance. A kid who says, there's no value in doing this. I'm going to work for two hours and I'm not going to get anything out of this. I mm-hmm. don't need to do this, you know. There's also the factor of shame avoidance. A lot of kids don't do things because if they do it, they will look or feel stupid. And that happens over and over and over again. And yeah. In front of a teacher, teacher, a classmate, or parent, they don't want to look. Nobody wants to look dumb. Right. And I, I think uh, and one of the things you talked about in the in the webinar was uh, cumulative toxicity, and I think that that's a such an important concept that anybody at a given time doesn't have an idea of what this kid has gone through from probably preschool, first kindergarten, first second grade, being told um, you're stupid or how come you can't get this, and then even just seeing other kids who are obviously can do it. And she can't, and she just gets more and more frustrated and down on herself. So I'm going to avoid this so I don't look stupid. Right. And you're right. These things are cumulative. They they build up over time. So a parent or a teacher sitting with a kid and saying, well, this is, this is really not that difficult. Why don't you just do this? It's like we're talking to somebody who's been traumatized by a fire saying, well, you can jump through this ring of fire. It's not going to harm you. You've got a fireproof suit on. Go ahead and yeah. jump. <laughs> yeah, you've got that fear and and all the emotions that went with your past experience. Exactly. So some kids don't like to do things because they're trying to uh, avoid success because it's a it's an ironic mm. kind of reaction. But some kids say, well, if I do this one thing correctly, she'll just give me more of it. And they're gonna every every time they get a new experience like this, it it reopens these wounds. This this cumulative toxicity and so if they do it right one time and they'll know that the reward for that is just getting more of it to do and they don't want to do that because it's a painful Mm -hmm. situation each time some kids you see kids resisting work because they want to stay in control they say things like you can't make me do this you know yeah not the boss of me and they display this uh aggressive passivity they don't work they hold they you know they just avoid things they look like i've seen a lot of kids and you probably have too who get a diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder mm-hmm. and these are really kids who are trying not to do something that makes them feel stupid or that makes them feel like they don't have control over a situation yeah i i think of uh oppositional defiant disorder as uh, basically a subset of ADHD with anger and yeah there's more emotional reactivity and some people with ADHD definitely have that Um, I don't know that I've ever seen anybody with just oppositional defiant disorder without the ADHD part and maybe yeah someone just has severe dyslexia they'd have that but there are other things 
going on, but it certainly is is a very real fight back and argue and how come I have to do this and uh, it's dumb, I, all kinds of uh, things. And, and that's tough because when a 12-year-old gets really angry um, and stomping around and yelling, often that pushes moms or dads or both of their buttons and then they get upset and yelling and things go downhill pretty quickly. Yeah. And that's why it's important. I think I, first of all, I agree with you in my almost 40 years of practice, I've seen probably a couple kids who might have legitimate diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder. They wake up in the morning and they say, who am I going to say no to today? It's a characterological yeah. thing. And most of the kids we work with are kids who've got all this buildup of negativity. So when they're oppositional, they're really just trying to protect themselves from looking foolish or looking like failures. And the, mm-hmm. the problem is that when they exhibit these behaviors, they're sometimes they're obnoxious behaviors. They push us away. They push teachers and parents away. And we react to the behavior as if yes. it's just willful, willful opposition. And it's hard at that moment to step back and say, wait a minute, there's something else. I got a nice, sweet kid here. He wouldn't do this unless he's trying to protect himself from something. Yeah, yeah, quite definitely the uh, um, that opposition in uh, – against teachers or saying uh, just get out of here and uh, is is a tough one to, to deal with. Um, one of the, is, the yeah. next things on, on uh, our list here was which is very common in a lot of studies in all kinds of different ways have said people with ADHD have a really hard time delaying gratification. I mean maybe they can make it 10 seconds but usually it's five. All right. Um, so, you know, what I've seen with this this uh, child yesterday was um, parents said, well, if you can get your homework done and, and the grade back, um, then you'll get video time. And child and parent both know that's four days from now. And that's right. not going to be motivation to get the book report finished tonight. Right, that's exactly right. The payoff has to be soon. It's like playing a slot machine. If you pull the lever and there's a, a winning combination, but you don't get the money for two weeks, you're yeah. not going to want to keep playing the game, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other thing is that if you have those kind of rewards, whether it's a video game or something else or money or prizes or trinkets or tokens at the end of it, what we're missing here, I think, is the fact that a lot of these kids don't get the, the that intrinsic reward from doing the work because they're so often not successful or they believe they're not successful. So they do a piece of work and it's something like they, 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 they look at it as something that needs to get done, not something that gives them pleasure. So playing a video Mm -hmm. game, they want to do it because it gives them pleasure. It rewards their reward center. It's, it, it makes them feel good. If they don't do well, they just play another game. You know, they're, they're in control of the situation and they're doing well at that. That's why a video game is so attractive to these kids. Yes, definitely. The having the control and oh, okay, I got knocked out or lost, whatever. Hit start and just go again. Right. Exactly right. Yeah. So that's why I advocate so strongly for a different way of uh, when you're working with kids who seem resistant, who seem oppositional, who seem not to have motivation, to try to think about uh, the kid's relationship with the task. So let's say a kid is really mm-hmm. good at math it's less likely that a child's going to be resistant to doing math if he or she feels that he's competent and he can do the math and, and he feels pretty strong about it. And then as soon as the math is over and it's time for reading or writing, if you've got a kid with ADHD and, and uh, related dyslexia, for example, mm-hmm. that kid may start, start exhibiting a behavior that looks like lack of motivation, but it's really fueled by a fear of failure and, and, a, and a very real situation in that the kid doesn't have the uh, skills that are needed to be successful. So mm-hmm. uh, I think it's important. I, I think it's really important to get kids to examine their relationship with the task before they're asked to do it. You know, do you, at the simplest level, do you think this is easy or hard? Do you think this is something you can do or something you're not going to be able to do? If, if, if I give you 
uh, Dr. Pomeroy, something to do, and you say, well, you know, I say, hey, I've got a new helicopter. I want you to go fly the helicopter. Oh, boy. Your reaction might be exactly that, oh, boy, meaning that sounds exciting. I've always wanted to do it. I'm really motivated to do it. Or, oh, boy, if I do that, we'll crash and burn. Uh, your, mot- your attitude about anybody's attitude about a task, the first thing your brain tells us usually sets the stage for what happens next. My wife mm-hmm. bought me helicopter lessons for my, my uh, a, 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 let's just say, a big birthday. It's something I've always wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And so I was highly motivated to do it. I was scared. I was nervous. But I yeah. really, really wanted to do it. So I overcame some obstacles. And I got, it, and I got that bucket list item off my list. But, but my, my, if my attitude would be, no way I'm going to do this, I would say, well, thanks, honey. That was a really nice gesture. But I, I can't accept your gift. And mm-hmm. we're sitting with kids who do exactly the same thing. They say, there's no way I can do this. I don't have the skills. I don't have the ability. So yeah. why well, keep trying? I, I, yeah, I got to get out yeah. of the airport. I don't even want to sit here. Yeah. And unfortunately, I, um, I think a lot of the learning disability things come to light when there's a concern about, gee, do you have ADHD? And the, the learning disability hasn't been uncovered. Or the other way around, it's quite obvious that um, a boy has dyslexia problems, but that can't be worked on because he's so hyperactive and distracted that his ADHD isn't under control. Um, exactly. So, yeah. Um, I another boy I saw earlier this week. Um, they had a neuropsych evaluation done a year ago, and the results were so all over the map, they said, well, we really can't make a good assessment of his learning disorder. seems like he has one, um, but his ADHD was so out of control, he couldn't sit still to do it. And my own bias is let's get the ADHD part at least under control, probably with some medications. Then you can go back and, and get a more reliable test. Right. The, the, the ADHD often gets in the way of, of the ability to get an accurate picture of a kid's yeah. uh, pot- potential. So it's a kind of a cloud hanging over performance. So, and then you've got the anxiety and the worry that comes with having the condition. A kid says, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I may be hyperactive. I may be impulsive. Uh, I'm also anxious because school is not a really happy place for me. I'm mm-hmm. not very successful. I don't know if I have a learning disability or not. I just know that this stuff is really, really very hard for me. I think I get looking for the exit sign all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the uh, we both understand that um, this is not usually a kid's fault. They aren't waking up and thinking, okay, how can I mess up today? Um, but their their brains are different than others. Um, and about five or six percent of kids with input uh, children up to age 18, five or six percent of them have this brain that works differently that we uh, call ADHD. Right. And I think when kids understand that it's a brain difference and, and, and not a brain deficit, and they can understand there are some ways to gain more control over what's happening on happening on a neurobiological level. They can finally get some get some purchase on their academic destiny. I mm-hmm. think if kids if kids have the the good fortune of going to an independent school where the part of the curriculum is uh, focused on helping kids understand their learning or attentional challenges, once kids have a better understanding of those things, they become better advocates, and lo and behold, they become better students. It's still going to mm-hmm. be hard for them, but. They're not thinking, well, I'm just stupid. I'm not a student. I, I, I don't deserve to be here. My teachers don't like me. I hate school. I mean, that's a real setup for failure. Yeah, yeah. And the lucky ones have a teacher somewhere along the line, particularly if it's first, second, or third grade, who understands this child needs a different approach. Let's um, figure it out. Right, um, All right. When you think about you think about the damage that can happen in one, two, or three years of school where a kid is sitting there kind of un, uh, in, in, in who he's a mystery to himself and he's getting a lot of negative feedback from people. It doesn't take too long to, p- to put a crack in that kid's armor and it's hard to build, build back. But a good teacher can make all the difference in the world, a good therapist. 
the mm-hmm. future working together is a really nice team when that can happen. Mm-hmm. So how can parents, who are the kind of first line in, in working with their children on this, how can they help um, their child get that growth mindset and positive, mm-hmm. I can do this, and, and have the motivation to sit down to do the math problems? Yeah, I think it's a it's a great question, and it's it's I would say it's it's not an easy it's it's a it's an easy answer, but it's difficult to do. But mm-hmm. it's like if you start off, somebody wants to teach you how to play tennis, and your initial your initial reaction is I'm clumsy, I'm not good at that. The ball is too small, the racket is too small, I can't do this. One of the things that changes that mindset, which is a kind of a fixed mindset of I can't, into uh, a, a more a more uh, flexible uh, mindset a positive mindset is having little successful experiences that build on top of each other. A lot of times kids have repeated experiences with failure and frustration. So their mindset, their attitude about themselves gets fixed Mm -hmm. and says, you know, look, every time you try something, you mess up. So you hear kids say, I'm a bad writer. I'm a bad, I'm terrible at reading. I'm bad at math. And so one of the reasons that a, a fixed mindset gets fixed is because there are a lot of things that reinforce it. So if you want to have a growth mindset, an attitude that says, I can and I will do this, uh, if you build in little incremental experiences or exposures to success, you can have more, more um you can have more success in getting mm-hmm. to move in that direction. Think of the video game example that you gave earlier. And one of the kids uh, reasons kids like video games so much is because they keep having success after success after success. They may have to change the game or they change the characters or they give the characters additional power. But if video games ended in failure, every time they played them, like school ends in failure every time they try it, these kids would throw their devices uh, in a sewer. Uh, yeah, yeah. If they had to get through yeah. level eight before they could even get back to level two, then it wouldn't work because you have to learn all the patterns and different quirks of it. Um, right. So that getting up a level is their success or, oh, I made it through that obstacle, which I couldn't do before, right. but now I figured out how to do it. So those are the, yeah, the incremental uh, rewards there. So you're, the people who are listening to your podcast, if they're like the people that I talk to across the country, they're saying, okay, that's great, but how can we do that? So I'm going to make a suggestion about something simple that your listeners uh, can try that a lot of teachers and parents that I've worked with have found very su- successful, but great. very simple, but very effective. And it's really a, a, a two-part process. If you're a parent sitting down with a kid looking at a homework assignment and the kid is looking negative or looking unmotivated and exhibiting some of those behaviors that we talked about earlier, the first thing I would say to parents uh, that if they're working with their child is to ask the child uh, question number one, how difficult do you think this is? So if they're looking at a math worksheet or a chapter of history or an essay they have to write, mm-hmm. they ask the kid to say, how difficult is this on a scale of one to five? One to me means kind of thumbs up, piece of cake, it's really easy. And five means, oh, my goodness, that's way too difficult for me. So five, mm-hmm. you can imagine five fingers up in front of your face saying no way. The second yeah. question you, you ask is how able do you think you are to do it? And they may say one thumbs up in this case means that I'm really able to do that. So if you think about if you think about a Navy SEAL, for example, and you say, how difficult is this task you're going in for? Navy SEAL will hold up five fingers and say, this is a wicked difficult task. This is really, really hard. And then the next question, how able you are, the Navy SEAL is going to put his or her thing, thumb up in the air and say, piece of cake. I do this all the time. I'm trained to do this. But mm-hmm. we've got a lot of kids who are looking at a task. They're saying, no, no way. This is too difficult. And five, no way I can do this. I'm not able to do this. So if a kid thinks a a, a piece of work is at a difficulty level of five or four, which I consider to be the no-go zone, the question you ask is, what can we do to this assignment to get it down to at least a three, which is kind of a work zone? How do, we, how do we change it? And some kids may say, I don't know. And the parent may say, well, look, you've got a page of 20 math problems. What if we give you each one of these one at a time and we have you pick which you think is the easiest one? And we'll start there. Hmm. That's a very simple example of yeah. how you can do that. 
if the kid says, I can't read this whole chapter tonight, when a parent might say, well, what if you read the first page and then I read the second page and you read the third page? How would that work for you? So it's not about making the task easier, but it's making the child's perception of the difficulty level less high, less toxic. Mm-hmm. And one of the... you finish. Yeah, go ahead. I uh, just wanted to pick up on one of the things you just said is following up with how would that work for you instead of just exactly. saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. You're going to read a page. I'm going to read a page. So why don't you go ahead? Checking in with, uh, and that's giving the child some control, how do you think that's going to work for you? Um, rather than just assuming, well, this is the way we're going to do it. Uh, I think that's a, right. that's a great, um, great part of it. It's a very respectful response. Mm-hmm. Parents will say to me, okay, I said, how will this work for you? Kids says, no, that stinks. I'm going to be, and then the parent can say in a hard situation like that, let's give, I read somewhere where this might be helpful. I heard somewhere where it might be helpful. Let's just try this tonight and let's see if it gets your rating of five down to your, down to a level of four. Let's just work for a small change right here. How would that work mm-hmm. for you? So yeah. you want to, the brain, the human brain loves to have successes, and it and it it becomes addicted to successes. That's why these video games are so important. It also hates failure, and it spends a lot of time building up this biological biochemical stew in the brain to say, well, "Let's get out of here." If it smells like difficulty, I'm gone. If it, if yeah. it tastes like difficulty, I'm gone. So you really need to turn that around. And and one of the uh, I think extra challenges with people with ADHD, and this relates to that brain structure uh, and function difference, is that the reward center seems to be less sensitive. So it takes a greater reward to feel like there's a um, something worth doing. Exactly right. Exactly right. So if you pull the arm on a slot machine and you get five nickels, you're going to say, what's that? That's the, who yeah. cares? You know? I'm going to walk away. If you get $5 coins, then you say, okay, you got my interest now. And you're right. Kids with ADHD have reward centers that need a little bit more put into them in order for the the product to the brain to work well. Mm -hmm. So there's the, the steps of asking how difficult do you think this is? And then how able do you feel on a one to five, scale, how able do you feel that you're going to be able to do it? Uh, and then right. work from there to say, gee, what can we do to to bring it down to three? So a, a collaborative approach instead of parents saying, well, this is what you have to do. Let's read through the instructions the fourth time. Or maybe I'll say it louder and you'll understand. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which I, and then if you, put, if you put the work that a kid does in a folder, called the success folder, you can say, well, homework B, which you have tonight, is pretty much like homework A, which you had last week. Let's pull that one out. You first said it was way too hard and that you didn't have the ability, but after we processed it, you said it wasn't as hard as you thought, and you, in fact, had a little more ability than you thought you had, and you liked it when we read every other page. So homework B tonight is kind of like that. So you have to do what I call setting a success anchor. You go back to a successful period. Mm -hmm. You You put the brain in a positive place instead of a negative I can't place. It's much more likely that the kid's going to say, oh, all right, okay, I'll try this one, but I'm, I'm not going to open myself up fully to it because I don't want to look stupid again. But, you know, Mom, Dad, you're making a good case. I did something like this yeah. last week, and maybe I can do it again. Yeah. That's how it starts to turn around. And, and I think within that is um, the, bringing, the parent bringing back up, this is where you succeeded. There's a, oh, you remember that, Mom, and – yeah, that I can see that's important to you, and that's a success right there. Um, yeah. And for the, I like the to say kid. athletes have a bedroom filled with trophies, right, because they get they do things well, yeah. they work hard, and they there. the kids you and I care about don't have a lot of tr- academic trophies sitting around their rooms. There's no evidence of their, their the, how hard yeah. they're working and their accomplishments. Exactly. Um, well, that sounds like a, a great strategy, and I'm – uh, I figure that's 
part of what you lay out in the, in your book that nowhere to hide why kids with ADHD and LD hate school. Um, yeah. And that would be the what we can do about it. And it certainly uh, sounds like a good approach. Uh, and a, the other thing that occurs to me with all this cumulative toxicity that the child's bringing into it as far as, oh, I'm a failure, is also the cumulative, I guess you'd call it toxicity to parents thinking, boy, we've been at this for a couple of years. I'm getting really frustrated, and this kid just isn't trying. So they need to be able to have some help to process their emotions around it too and get Absolutely. some hope that, all right, this can, can work. Um, so that's a, a really great perspective. Well, as, as usual with many of uh, my podcasts, we're coming to the need to, to close the discussion a lot sooner than uh, I'd like, but um, we do have some other things we talked about uh, addressing pops possibly in a second show. Um, so hopefully we can put that together. But right now, uh, I'd like to come up with a couple of summary points. Um, and I think the, the, the great starting point is for a parent to step back and think from your child's perspective, what's going on with this task and what's not working for them because their behaviors aren't with an intent to um, get you mad or get out of the work. There's something underlying that that, that is really too scary for them. Um, and part of that in terms of being able to do it or not is that there are brain differences in the, in the structure and the function of uh, people who have ADHD and learning disorders. They aren't, it's not bad, it's not a defect, it's a difference. Just like some people wear glasses and some don't. Um, and then the, the third point is that uh, there is a process that's fairly simple, pretty straightforward to be able to help turn that negative accumulated uh, self-perception into a positive, get some incremental success, and that will keep building the more success is there. Have I, have I missed anything, Dr. Schultz, in that? That's a very great and succinct uh, summary. That's perfect. I would just add before we close that you mentioned before the understood website, they just shortened their uh, uh, URL to get to the site. Now it's just u.org. And I've oh. written a lot of things about these related topics there. So if your listeners want to tune into understood.org by going to u.org, uh, they'll find just Google, to put my name in the search bar, and they'll come up with some things that will supplement some of the things we've been talking about today and reinforce them. Great. Well, thank you so much. My guest has been uh, Dr. Jerome Schultz, who is a neuropsychologist of 38 years experience and prior to that had been a special education teacher so he knows exactly what's going on from a lot of different perspectives there. He's written a book, Nowhere to Hide, Why Kids with ADHD and LD Hate School and What We Can Do About It. He also writes frequently for Attitude Magazine which is attitudemag.com and understood.org, which is now u.org. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Schultz, for being on the show, and I look forward to being able to talk with you some more. I hope we have that opportunity. Thanks for having me on, Dr. Palmer, and good luck to you. Thank you, and to my listeners, thanks for listening, and stay tuned. We'll continue to have good shows in the future to help you and your child, spouse, parent deal with uh, ADHD issues. Mm -hmm.